Triplanetary, first in the Lensman series by E. E. Doc Smith. Chapter 11 Nevian Strife The Nevian spaceship was hurtling upon its way. Space navigators both, the two terrestrial officers, soon discovered that it was even then moving with a velocity far above that of light, and that it must be accelerating at a high rate, even though to them it seemed stationary. They could feel only a gravitational force somewhat less than that of their native Earth. Bradley, seasoned old campaigner that he was, had retired promptly as soon as he had completed a series of observations and was sleeping soundly upon a pile of cushions in the first of the three interconnecting rooms. In the middle room, which was to be Cleo's, Costigan was standing very close to the girl but was not touching her. His body was rigid, his face was tense and drawn. "'You are wrong, Conway. All wrong,' Cleo was saying very seriously. "'I know how you feel, but it's false chivalry.' That isn't it at all, he insisted stubbornly. It isn't only that I've got you out here in space, in danger and alone, that's stopping me. I know you, and I know myself well enough to know that what we start now we'll go through with for life. It doesn't make any difference that way whether I start making love to you now or whether I wait until we're back on Tellus. But I'm telling you that for your own good you'd better pass me up entirely. I've got enough horsepower to keep away from you if you tell me to, not otherwise. I know it both ways, dear, but—but but nothing, he interrupted. Can't you get it into your skull what you'll be letting yourself in for if you marry me? Assume that we get back, which isn't sure by any means. But even if we do, some day, and maybe soon, too, you can't tell, somebody is going to collect fifty grams of radium for my head. Fifty grams! And everybody knows that Sam's himself is rated at only sixty? I knew that you were somebody, Conway, Cleo exclaimed, undeterred. But at that something tells me that any pirate will earn even that much reward several times over before he collects it. Don't be silly, my dear. Good night. She tipped her head back, holding up to him her red, sweetly curved, smiling lips, and his arms swept around her. Her arms went up around his neck, and they stood, clasped together in the motionless ecstasy of love's first embrace. "'Girl, how I love you!' Costigan's voice was husky. His usually hard eyes were glowing with a tender light. "'That settles that. I'll really live now, anyway, while—' "'Stop it,' she commanded sharply. "'You're going to live until you die of old age. See if you don't. You'll simply have to, Conway.' That's so, too. No percentage in dying now. All the pirates between Tellus and Andromeda couldn't take me after this. I've got too much to live for. Well, good night, sweetheart. I'd better beat it. You need some sleep. The lover's parting was not as simple and straightforward a procedure as Costigan's speech would indicate, but finally he did seek his own room and relaxed upon a pile of cushions, his stern visage transformed. Instead of the low metal ceiling he saw a beautiful, oval, tanned young face framed in a golden blonde corona of hair. His gaze sank into the depths of loyal, honest, dark blue eyes, and looking deeper and deeper into those blue wells he fell asleep. Upon his face too set and grim by far for a man of his years, the lives of sector chiefs of the Triplanetary Service were not easy, nor as a rule were they long. There lingered as he slept that newly acquired softness of expression, the reflection of his transcendent happiness. For eight hours he slept soundly, as was his wont. Then, also according to his habit and training, he came wide awake, with no intermediate stage of napping. Cleo he whispered. Awake, girl? Awake! Her voice came through the ultraphone, relief in every syllable. Good heavens, I thought you were going to sleep until we got to wherever it is that we're going. Come on in, you two. I don't see how you can possibly sleep, just as though you were home in bed. You've got to learn to sleep anywhere if you expect to keep in—' Costigan broke off as he opened the door 
and saw Cleo's wan face. She had evidently spent a sleepless and racking eight hours. Good Lord, Cleo, why didn't you call me? Oh, I'm all right, except for being a little jittery. No need of asking how you feel, is there? No, I feel hungry, he answered cheerfully. I'm going to see what we can do about it. Or say, I guess I'll see whether they're still interfering on Sam's wave. He took out the small insulated case and touched the contact stud lightly with his finger. His arm jerked away powerfully. Still at it, he gave the unnecessary explanation. They don't seem to want us to talk outside. But this interference is as good as my talking. They can trace it, of course. Now I'll see what I can find out about our breakfast. He stepped over to the plate and shot its projector beam forward into the control room, where he saw Nerado lying dog-like at his instrument panel. As Costigan's beam entered the room, a blue light flashed on, and the Nevian turned an eye and an arm toward his own small observation plate. Knowing that they were now in visual communication, Costigan beckoned an invitation and pointed to his mouth in what he hoped was the universal sign of hunger. The Nevian waved an arm and fingered controls, and as he did so a wide section of the floor of Cleo's room slid aside. The opening thus made revealed a table which rose upon its low pedestal, a table equipped with three softly cushioned benches, and spread with a glittering array of silver and glassware. Bowls and platters of a dazzlingly white metal, narrow-waisted goblets of sheerest crystal, all were hexagonal, beautifully and intricately carved and etched in apparently conventional marine designs. And the table utensils of this strange race were peculiar indeed. There were tearing forceps of sixteen needle-sharp curved teeth, there were flexible spatulas, there were deep and shallow ladles with flexible edges, there were many other peculiarly curved instruments at whose uses the terrestrials could not even guess, all having delicately fashioned handles to fit the long slender fingers of the Nevians. But if the table and its appointments were surprising to the terrestrials, revealing as they did a degree of culture which none of them had expected to find in a race of beings so monstrous, the food was even more surprising, although in another sense. For the wonderful crystal goblets were filled with a grayish-green slime of a nauseous and overpowering odor. The smaller bowls were full of living sea spiders and other such delicacies, and each large platter contained a fish fully a foot long, raw and whole, garnished tastefully with red, purple, and green strands of seaweed. Cleo looked once, then gasped shutting her eyes and turning away from the table, but Costigan flipped the three fish into a platter and set it aside before he turned back to the visiplate. They'll go good fried, he remarked to Bradley, signaling vigorously to Nerado that the meal was not acceptable and that he wanted to talk to him in person. Finally he made himself clear, the table sank down out of sight, and the Nevian commander cautiously entered the room. At Costigan's insistence, he came up to the visiplate, leaving near the door three alert and fully armed guards. The man then shot the beam into the galley of the pirate's lifeboat, suggesting that they should be allowed to live there. For some time the argument of arms and fingers raged, though not exactly fluent conversation, both sides managed to convey their meanings quite clearly. Nerado would not allow the terrestrials to visit their own ship. He was taking no chances. But after a thorough ultra-ray inspection, he did finally order some of his men to bring into the middle room the electric range and a supply of terrestrial food. Soon the Nevian fish were sizzling in a pan, and the appetizing odors of coffee and browning biscuit permeated the room. But at the first appearance of those odors, the Nevians departed hastily, content to watch the remainder of the curious and repulsive procedure in their busy ray plates. Breakfast over, and everything made tidy and shipshape, Costigan turned to Cleo. Look here, girl, you've got to learn how to sleep. You're all in. 
Your eyes look like you've been on a Martian picnic, and you didn't eat half enough breakfast. You've got to sleep and eat to keep fit. We don't want you passing out on us, so I'll put out this light, and you'll lie down here and sleep until noon. Oh, no, don't bother. I'll sleep tonight. I'm quite— You'll sleep now, he informed her levelly. I never thought of you being nervous with Bradley and me on each side of you. We're both right here now, though, and we'll stay here. We'll watch over you like a couple of old hens with one chick between them. Come on, lie down and go bye-bye. Cleo laughed at the simile, but lay down obediently. Costigan sat upon the edge of the great divan, holding her hand, and they chatted idly. The silences grew longer, Cleo's remarks became fewer, and soon her long-lashed eyelids fell, and her deep, regular breathing showed that she was sound asleep. The man stared at her, his very heart in his eyes. So young, so beautiful, so lovely! And how he did love her! He was not formally religious, but his every thought was a prayer. If he could only get her out of this mess! He wasn't fit to live on the same planet with her, but just give him one chance, God, just one! But Costigan had been laboring for days under a terrific strain, and he had been going very short on sleep. Half hypnotized by his own mixed emotions, and by his staring at the smooth curves of Cleo's cheek, his own eyes closed, and still holding her hand, he sank down into the soft cushions beside her and into oblivion. Thus sleeping hand in hand like two children, Bradley found them, and a tender fatherly expression came over his face as he looked down at them. Nice little girl, Cleo, he mused, and when they made Costigan they broke the mold. They'll do. About as fine a couple of kids as old Tellus ever produced. I could do with some more sleep myself. He yawned prodigiously, lay down at Cleo's left, and in minutes was himself asleep. Hours later both men were awakened by a merry peal of laughter. Cleo was sitting up, regarding them with sparkling eyes. She was refreshed, buoyant, ravenously hungry, and highly amused. Costigan was amazed and annoyed at what he considered a failure in his self-appointed task. Bradley was calm and matter-of-fact. "'Thanks for being such a nice bodyguard, you two. Cleo laughed again, but sobered quickly. "'I slept wonderfully well, but I wonder if I can sleep tonight without making you hold my hand all night?' "'Oh, he doesn't mind doing that,' Bradley commented. Mind it, Costigan exclaimed, and his eyes and his tone spoke volumes. They prepared and ate another meal, one to which Cleo did full justice. Rested and refreshed, they had begun to discuss possibilities of escape when Narado and his three armed guards entered the room. The Nevian scientist placed a box upon a table and began to make adjustments upon its panels, eyeing the terrestrials attentively after each setting. After a time a staccato burst of articulated speech issued from the box, and Costigan saw a great light. "'You've got it! Hold it!' he exclaimed, waving his arms excitedly. "'You see, Cleo, their voices are pitched either higher or lower than ours, probably higher, and they've built an audio frequency changer. He's nobody's fool, that lizard!' Nerado heard Costigan's voice. There was no doubt of that. His long neck looped and twisted in Nevian gratification, and, although neither side could understand the other, both knew that intelligent speech and hearing were attributes common to the two races. This fact altered markedly the relations between captors and captives. The Nevians admitted amongst themselves that the strange bipeds might be quite intelligent after all, and the terrestrials at once became more hopeful. It isn't so bad if they can talk, Costigan summed up the situation. We might as well take it easy and make the best of it, particularly since we haven't been able to figure out any possible way of getting away from them. They can talk and hear, and we can learn their language in time. Maybe we can make some sort of deal with them to take us back to our own system, if we can't make a break. The Nevians, being as eager as the terrestrials to establish communication, 
Nerado kept the newly devised frequency changer in constant use. There is no need of describing at length the details of that interchange of languages. Suffice it to say that, starting at the very bottom, they learned as babies learned, but with the great advantage over babies, of possessing fully developed and capable brains. And while the humans were learning the tongue of Nebia, several of the amphibians and, incidentally, Cleo Marston, were learning Triplanetarian, the two officers knowing well that it would be much easier for the Nebians to learn the logically built common language of the three planets than to master the senseless intricacies of English. In a short time the two parties were able to understand each other after a fashion by using a weird mixture of both languages. As soon as a few ideas had been exchanged, the Nevian scientists built transformers small enough to be worn collar-like by the terrestrials, and the captives were allowed to roam at will throughout the great vessel, only the compartment in which was stored the dismembered pirate lifeboat being sealed to them. Thus it was that they were not left long in doubt when another fish-shaped cruiser of the void was revealed upon their lookout plates in the awful emptiness of interstellar space. This is our sister ship going to your Solarian system for a cargo of the iron which is so plentiful there, Narado explained to his involuntary guests. I hope the gang has got the bugs worked out of our super ship. Costigan muttered savagely to his companions, as Narado turned away. If they have, that outfit will get something more than a load of iron when they get there. More time passed, during which a blue-white star separated itself from the infinitely distant firmament, and began to show a perceptible disk. Larger and larger it grew, becoming bluer and bluer as the flying spaceship approached it, until finally Nevia could be seen apparently close beside her parent orb. Heavily laden though the vessel was, such was her power that she was soon dropping vertically downward toward a large lagoon in the middle of the Nevian city. That bit of open water was devoid of life, for this was to be no ordinary landing. Under the terrific power of the beams breaking the descent of that unimaginable load of allotropic iron, the water seethed and boiled, and instead of floating gracefully upon the surface of the sea, this time the huge ship of space sank like a plummet to the bottom. Having accomplished the delicate feat of docking the vessel safely in the immense cradle prepared for her, Nerado turned to the Tellurians, who, now under guard, had been brought before him. While our cargo of iron is being discharged, I am to take you three specimens to the College of Science, where you are to undergo a thorough physical and psychological examination. Follow me." "'Wait a minute!' protested Costigan, with a quick and furtive wink at his companions. "'Do you expect us to go through water, and at this frightful depth?' "'Certainly,' replied the Nevian in surprise. You are air-breathers, of course, but you must be able to swim a little, and this slight depth, but little more than thirty of your meters, will not trouble you. You are wrong twice, declared the terrestrial, convincingly. If by swimming you mean propelling yourself in or through the water, we know nothing of it. In water over our heads we drown helplessly in a minute or two, and the pressure at this depth would kill us instantly. Well, I could take a lifeboat, of course, but that— The Nevian captain began doubtfully, but broke off at the sound of a staccato call from his signal panel. Captain Nerado, attention! Nerado, he acknowledged into a microphone, the third city is being attacked by the fishes of the greater deeps. They have developed new and powerful mobile fortresses, mounting unheard of weapons, and the city reports that it cannot long withstand their attack. They are asking for all possible help. Your vessel not only has vast stores of iron, but also mounts weapons of power. You are requested to proceed to their aid at the earliest possible moment." Nerado snapped out orders, and the liquid iron fell in streams from wide open ports, forming a vast red pool in the bottom of the dock. In a short time the great vessel was in equilibrium with the water she displaced 
and as soon as she had attained a slight buoyancy the ports snapped shut and Nerado threw on the power. "'Go back to your own quarters and stay there until I send for you,' the Nevian directed, and as the terrestrials obeyed the curt order the cruiser tore herself from the water and flashed up into the crimson sky. "'What a bare-faced liar!' Bradley exclaimed. The three, transformers cut off, were back in the middle room of their suite. You can outswim an otter, and I happen to know that you came up out of the old DZ-83 from a depth of— Maybe I did exaggerate a trifle, Costigan interrupted. But the more helpless he thinks we are, the better for us. And we want to stay out of any of their cities as long as we can, because they may be hard places to get out of. I've got a couple of ideas, but they aren't ripe enough to pick yet. Wow, how this bird's been traveling! We're there already! If he hits the water going like this, he'll split himself sure." With undiminished velocity they were flashing downward in a long slant toward the beleaguered Third City, and from the flying vessel there was launched toward the city's central lagoon a torpedo. No missile this! but a capsule containing a full ton of allotropic iron which could be of more use to the Nevian defenders than millions of men. For the third city was sore pressed indeed. Around it was one unbroken ring of boiling, exploding water, water billowing upward in searing, blinding bursts of superheated steam, or being hurled bodily in all directions in solid masses by the cataclysmic forces being released by the embattled fishes of the greater deeps. Her outer defenses were already down, and even as the terrestrials stared in amazement, another of the immense hexagonal buildings burst into fragments, its upper structure flying wildly into scrap metal, its lower half subsiding drunkenly below the surface of the boiling sea. The three Earth people seized whatever supports were at hand as the Nevian spaceship struck the water with undiminished speed, but the precaution was needless. Nerado knew thoroughly his vessel, its strengths, and its capabilities. There was a mighty splash, but that was all. The artificial gravity was unchanged by the impact. To the passengers the vessel was still motionless, and on even keel as, now a submarine, she snapped around like a very fish and attacked the rear of the nearest fortress. For fortresses they were, vast structures of green metal, plowing forward implacably upon immense caterpillar treads, and as they crawled they destroyed, and Costigan, exploring the strange submarine with his visiray beam, watched and marveled. For the fortresses were full of water, water artificially cooled and aerated, entirely separate from the boiling flood through which they moved. They were manned by fish some five feet in length, fish with huge goggling eyes, fish plentifully equipped with long arm-like tentacles, fish poised before control panels or darting about intent upon their various duties, fish with brains waging war. Nor was their warfare ineffectual. Their heat rays boiled the water for hundreds of yards before them, and their torpedoes were exploding against the Nevian defenses in one appallingly continuous concussion. But most potent of all was a weapon unknown to triplanetary warfare. From a fortress there would shoot out, with the speed of a meteor, a long, jointed telescopic rod tipped with a tiny, brilliantly shining ball. Whenever that glowing tip encountered any obstacle, that obstacle disappeared in an explosion world-racking in its intensity. Then what was left of the rod, dark now, would be retracted into the fortress, only to emerge again in a moment with a tip once more shining and potent. Nerado, apparently as unfamiliar with the peculiar weapon as were the terrestrials, attacked cautiously, sending out far to the fore his murky, impenetrable screens of red. But the submarine was entirely non-ferrous, and its officers were apparently quite familiar with Nevian beams, which licked at and clung to the green walls in impotent fury. 
Through the red veil came stabbing ball after ball, and only the most frantic dodging saved the spaceship from destruction in those first few furious seconds. And now the Nevian defenders of the Third City had secured and were employing the vast store of allotropic iron so opportunely delivered by Narado. From the city there pushed out immense nets of metal, extending from the surface of the ocean to its bottom, nets radiating such terrific forces that the very water itself was beaten back and stood motionless in vertical glassy walls. Torpedoes were futile against that wall of energy. The most fiercely driven rays of the fishes flamed incandescent against it in vain. Even the incredible violence of a concentration of every available force ball against one point could not break through. At that unimaginable explosion water was hurled for miles. The bed of the ocean was not only exposed, but in it there was blown a crater, at whose dimensions the terrestrials dared not even guess. The crawling fortresses themselves were thrown backward violently, and the very world was rocked to its core by the concussion, but that iron-driven wall held. The massive nets swayed and gave back, and tidal waves hurled their mountainously destructive masses through the third city, but the mighty barrier remained intact. And Nerado, still attacking two of the powerful tanks with his every weapon, was still dodging those flashing balls charged with the quintessence of destruction. The fishes could not see through the sub-ethereal veil, but all the gunners of the two fortresses were combing it thoroughly with ever-lengthening, ever-thrusting rods in a desperate attempt to wipe out the new and apparently all-powerful Nevian submarine whose sheer power was slowly but inexorably crushing even their gigantic walls. Well, I think that right now's the best chance we'll ever have of doing something for ourselves. Costigan turned away from the absorbing scenes pictured upon the visiplate and faced his two companions. But what can we possibly do? asked Cleo. Whatever it is, we'll try it, Bradley exclaimed. Anything's better than staying here and letting them analyze us. No telling what they do to us, Costigan went on. I know a lot more about things than they think I do. They never did catch me using my spy ray. It's on an awfully narrow beam, you know, and uses almost no power at all. So I've been able to dope out quite a lot of stuff. I can open most of their locks, and I know how to run their small boats. This battle, fantastic as it is, is deadly stuff, and it isn't one-sided by any means, either, so that every one of them, from Nerado down, seems to be on emergency duty. There are no guards watching us or stationed where we want to go. Our way is open. And once out, this battle is giving us our best possible chance to get away from them. There's so much emission out there already that they probably couldn't detect the driving force of the lifeboat, and they'll be too busy to chase us anyway. Once out, then what? asked Bradley. We'll have to decide that before we start, of course. I'd say make a break back for Earth. We know the direction, and we'll have plenty of power. But, good heavens, Conway, it's so far, exclaimed Cleo. How about food, water, and air? Would we ever get there? You know as much about that as I do. I think so, but of course anything might happen. This ship is none too big, is considerably slower than the big spaceship, and we're a long ways from home. Another bad thing is the food question. The boat is well stocked, according to Nevian ideas, but it's pretty foul stuff for us to eat. However, it's nourishing, and we'll have to eat it, since we can't carry enough of our own supplies to the boat to last long. Even so, we may have to go on short rations, but I think we'll be able to make it. On the other hand, what happens if we stay here? They will find us sooner or later, and we don't know any too much about these ultra-weapons. We are land-dwellers, and there is little, if any, land on this planet. Then, too, we don't know where to look for what land there may be, and even if we could find it, we know that it is all overrun with amphibians already. There's a lot of things that might be better, but they might be a lot worse, too. How about it? 
Do we try or do we stay here? We try it, exclaimed Cleo and Bradley as one. All right, I'd better not waste any more time talking. Let's go. Stepping up to the locked and shielded door, he took out a peculiarly built torch and pointed it at the Nevian lock. There was no light, no noise, but the massive portal swung smoothly open. They stepped out, and Costigan relocked and reshielded the entrance. How? What? Cleo demanded. I've been going to school for the last few weeks, Costigan grinned, and I've picked up quite a few things here and there. Literally, as well as figuratively. Snap it up, guys. Our armor is stored with the pieces of the pirate's lifeboat, and I'll feel a lot better when we've got it on and have hold of a few Lewistons. They hurried down corridors, up ramps and along hallways, with Costigan's spy ray investigating the course ahead for chance Nevians. Bradley and Cleo were unarmed, but the operative had found a piece of flat metal and had ground it to a razor edge. I think I can throw this thing straight enough and fast enough to chop off a Nevian's head before he can put a paralyzing ray on us, he explained grimly, but he was not called upon to show his skill with the improvised cleaver. As he had concluded from his careful survey, every Nevian was at some control or weapon, doing his part in that frightful combat with the denizens of the greater deeps. Their path was open. They were neither molested nor detected as they ran toward the compartment within which was sealed all their belongings. The door of that room opened, as had the other, to Costigan's knowing beam, and all three set hastily to work. They made up packs of food, filled their capacious pockets with emergency rations, buckled on Lewistons and automatics, donned their armor, and clamped into their external holsters a full complement of additional weapons. "'Now comes the ticklish part of the business,' Costigan informed the others. His helmet was slowly turning this way and that, and the others knew that through his spy-ray goggles he was studying their route. "'There's only one boat we stand a chance of reaching, and somebody's mighty apt to see us. There's a lot of detectors up there, and we'll have to cross a corridor full of communicator beams. There, that line's off. Scoot!' At his word they dashed out into the hall and hurried along for minutes, dodging sharply to right or left as the leader snapped out orders. Finally he stopped. "'Here's those beams I told you about. We'll have to roll under em. They're less than waist-high. Right there's the lowest one. Watch me do it, and when I give the word, one at a time, you do the same. Keep low. Don't let an arm or leg get up into the ray, or they may see us.' He threw himself flat, rolled upon the floor a yard or so, and scrambled to his feet. He gazed intently at the blank wall for a space. Bradley, now, he snapped, and the captain duplicated his performance. But Cleo, unused to the heavy and cumbersome space armor she was wearing, could not roll in it with any degree of success. When Costigan barked his order she tried but stopped, floundering almost directly below the network of invisible beams. As she struggled, one mailed arm went up, and Costigan saw in his ultra-goggles the faint flash as the beam encountered the interfering field. But already he had acted. Crouching low, he struck down the arm, seized it, and dragged the girl out of the zone of visibility. Then, in furious haste, he opened the nearby door, and all three sprang into a tiny compartment. "'Shut off all the fields of your suits so that they can't interfere,' he hissed into the utter darkness. "'Not that I'd mind killing a few of these, but if they start an organized search we're sunk. But even if they did get a warning by touching your glove, Cleo, they probably won't suspect us. Our rooms are still shielded, and the chances are that they're too busy to bother much about us anyway.' He was right. A few beams darted here and there, but the Nevians saw nothing amiss, and ascribed the interference to the falling into the beam of some chance bit of charged metal. With no further misadventures, the fugitives gained entrance to the Nevian lifeboat, where Costigan's first act was to disconnect one steel boot from his armor of space. With a sigh of relief he pulled his foot out of it, and from it 
carefully poured into the small power tank of the craft fully thirty pounds of allotropic iron. I pinched it off them, he explained, in answer to amazed and inquiring looks. And maybe you don't think it's a relief to get it out of that boot. I couldn't steal a flask to carry it in, so this was the only place I could put it. These lifeboats are equipped with only a couple of grams of iron apiece, you know, and we couldn't get halfway back to tell us on that, even with smooth going, and we may have to fight. With this much to go on, though, we could go on to Andromeda fighting all the way. Well, we'd better break away. Costigan watched his plate closely, and, when the maneuvering of the great vessel brought his exit port as far away as possible from the third city and its warring tanks, he shot the little cruiser out and away. Straight out into the ocean it sped, through the murky red veil, and darted upward toward the surface. The three wanderers sat tense, hardly daring to breathe, staring into the plates. Cleo and Bradley, pushing at mental levers and stepping down hard upon mental brakes in unconscious efforts to help Costigan dodge the beams and rods of death flashing so appallingly close upon all sides. Out of the water and into the air the darting, dodging lifeboat flashed in safety, but in the air, supposedly free from menace, came disaster. There was a crunching, grating shock and the vessel was thrown into a dizzy spiral from which Costigan finally leveled it into headlong flight away from the scene of battle. Watching the pyrometers which recorded the temperature of the outer shell, he drove the lifeboat ahead at the highest safe atmospheric speed while Bradley went to inspect the damage. Pretty bad, but better than I thought, the captain reported. Outer and inner plates broken away on a seam. We couldn't hold cotton waste, let alone air. Any tools aboard? Some, and what we haven't got we'll make, Costigan declared. We'll put a lot of distance between us, then we'll fix her up and get away from here. What are those fish anyway, Conway? Cleo asked, as the lifeboat tore along. The Nevians are bad enough, heaven knows, but the very idea of intelligent and educated fish is enough to drive one mad. You know, Narado mentioned several times the semi-civilized fishes of the greater deeps, he reminded her. I gather that there are at least three intelligent races here. We know, too, the Nevians, who are amphibians, and the fishes of the greater deeps. The fishes of the lesser deeps are also intelligent. As I get it, the Nevian cities were originally built in very shallow water, or perhaps were upon islands. The development of machinery and tools gave them a big edge on the fish, and those living in the shallow seas nearest the islands gradually became tributary nations, if not actually slaves. Those fish not only serve as food, but work in the mines, hatcheries, and plantations, and do all kinds of work for the Nevians. Those so-called lesser deeps were conquered first, of course and all their races of fish are docile enough now, but the deep-sea breeds, who live in water so deep that the Nevians can hardly stand the pressure down there, were more intelligent to start with, and more stubborn besides. But the most valuable metals here are deep down. This planet is very light for its size, you know. So the Nevians kept at it until they conquered some of the deep-sea fish, too, and put them to work. But those high-pressure boys were nobody's fools. They realized that as time went on, the amphibians would get further and further ahead of them in development, so they let themselves be conquered, learned how to use the Nevians' tools and everything else they could get hold of, developed a lot of new stuff on their own, and now they're out to wipe the amphibians off the map completely before they get too far ahead of them to handle. And the Nevians are afraid of them, and want to kill them all as fast as they possibly can?" guessed Cleo. That would be the logical thing, of course, commented Bradley. Got pretty nearly enough distance now, Costigan. There isn't enough distance on the planet to suit me, Costigan replied. We'll need all we can get. A full diameter away from that crew of amphibians is too close for comfort. Their detectors are keen. Then they can detect us? Cleo asked. Oh, I wish they hadn't hit us. 
We'd have been away from here long ago. So do I, Costigan agreed feelingly. But they did. No use squawking. We can rivet and weld those seams, and things could be a lot worse. We are still breathing air. In silence, the lifeboat flashed onward, and half of Nevia's mighty globe was traversed before it was brought to a halt. Then, in furious haste, the two officers set to work, again, to make their small craft sound and spaceworthy. End of chapter 11